Today with the carousel system, we are milking these 800 animals in about three hours and 15 to three and a half hours. The carousel is made up of 48 positions. So the cow enters her spot, makes the complete turn where she is milked, and then exits this space. If they don't do a good pre-dipping, a proper stimulation of the cow, the cow won't release the milk. Welcome to the Santa Fe Agro Institute channel, and now we're here at the Arcego Farms milking station together with Vinicius. Vinicius, what is being done at this moment? So the milking process right after the milk extraction is finished involves washing the equipment. The machine itself does the automatic cleaning by spraying, and then we manually clean by scrubbing, spraying, and removing excess manure and other residues. And why is this important? It's all about the quality of the milk. The environment needs to be clean, just like a bakery or a restaurant. The place must be clean for the process to be done properly. If it's full of manure, we will likely have issues that affect hygiene. I see. So for the consumer, for the person who goes to the supermarket shelf to buy milk, it's important to know that there's an entire cleaning and sanitization process involved in milk extraction. This is not just done haphazardly. It's not just about the cow entering the system and that's it. Let's take advantage of the fact that it's not milking time yet. As you mentioned, the first milking is at 4 a.m., then at noon, and at 8 p.m. So, how does it work? Where does the cow go first? What's the first place she arrives at? Here's the waiting room where the cows come from the lots, from the barn. They stay in the waiting room, waiting for the milking time. After that, they enter this corridor. Each stall is a place where the cow stays. The carousel is made up of 48 positions. So the cow enters her spot, makes the complete turn where she is milked, and then exits this space. So the cow comes to the waiting room. And this is where you mentioned the ventilation, cooling, and spraying. This is the spraying area, which is different from ventilation. Exactly. We have both. There's ventilation with fans and spraying with water. I see. So the cow comes here, and this place will fill up with cows. And it starts... Now, how does she know it's her turn to come in here? Well, at first, when we were adapting the animals, they didn't want to come in. But once they got used to the routine, they started fighting to get in here. They line up in a single file. As soon as one enters, the next one follows, positioning herself to enter. When the system changes, you have to adapt them again. Folks, the animals were used to one way. How was it before? What was the milking process like before? Before, it was a midline system, but in a herringbone layout. Fourteen cows would enter on each side. They would line up in a single file, position themselves, get milked, and then leave. How many cows enter here now? Here, it's 48. From 14 cows in the milking line to 48, how did this change things for you in terms of time and milk quality? When we had the old milking system, we practically had no time between one milking session and the next, they were almost continuous. Today with the carousel system, we are milking these 800 animals in about three hours and 15 to three and a half hours. So this means the cows spend less time standing. The milking process has become faster and more efficient. Here we work with a lower KPA pressure. So it's less aggressive on the cow's udder, which helps maintain better udder health. Consequently, does this improve the milk quality? Does it improve and has it reduced mastitis in the animals? It has decreased. Before, we had around 800 SCC, which is the somatic cell count. Today, the farm is around 350 to 400. So, just to make sure I understand, how did the farm go from 800,000 SCC to 350? Is it because of this system here? So, this system helped. It helped. But just this system alone doesn't solve it. No, 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 it helped. Because before we worked with higher KPA. So it was more aggressive on the cow's sphincter. The sphincter is the physical mechanical structure that protects the internal environment of the udder from the external environment. Here we have less injury. So the hyperkeratosis in these cows 
has greatly decreased. Of course, we had to cull some problematic animals from the system, but the system has helped in terms of milking quality. Now, here's a question that many people watching might be asking. What is KPA? KPA is the pressure that the machine applies to the teat to extract the milk. So folks, what Vinicius was saying is that in the previous system, the pressure was higher. The vacuum pressure was higher, which as a result would slightly injure the cow's teat. With the new system, you've been able to regulate that pressure, reducing this discomfort and the fissures on the cow's teat. Because the cow's teat has a structure called the sphincter. If this structure experiences any level of stress from this pressure, it will eventually stay open. If this structure stays open, it comes into direct contact with the external environment, affecting the internal environment of the udder. And then the SEC went down. How was it for you, especially in your daily routine, in the lives of the farm owners, and for those working here, when you realize, wow, the SEC went down, did it bring relief? How was that for you? Certainly. Besides the increase in production in the animals, we managed to reduce this uh, udder gland infection, which also increased the value of the product. Because we are paid for milk quality, fat, protein, SCC, CBT. So all of this contributed to an increase in the value per liter of milk paid. So focusing on lowering the SCC from 800 to 350 is not an easy task, but it has guaranteed financial returns. Exactly. So it's also an investment. As you can see, this is a complex universe. We start with the kitchen, then we show that if there's no fan, the bedding won't dry. If you come here to the system and the vacuum isn't calibrated, it can injure the cow's teat. The animal, as I see it now, is a sensitive creature. If you handle it the wrong way, it will respond to you. And when does it respond? It responds by reducing production. This animal ends up being culled more frequently because if the animal isn't efficient in the system, we can't keep it in the farm's routine because it has a fixed cost. If this animal's production drops by a certain amount per day, we can't maintain it. We have a cost to keep this cow here. That's why we invest in good quality machines, both for feeding and for milking, providing comfort for these animals because we want them to produce milk for the farm. Now, out of curiosity, how much does a system like this cost to implement, more or less? At the time, it was pre-pandemic, so we didn't see all the price increases, but back then it was around $350,000. $350,000 to set up all this equipment, everything you see here for $350,000? Just the machine. Just the machine. Just the milking system. But the structure, everything, the fan, the spraying system. That would be an additional cost. So if you invest $350,000 and the person doing the milking doesn't know what they're doing? It will go wrong. Money isn't everything. It's like having a Ferrari and driving it on a dirt road. The Ferrari would be the milking system and the road would be the milker. So we need synergy between the two. The machine has to work well, but the person operating the machine must follow the process precisely as explained. And how was the training for the milking staff? Because that might have also impacted the reduction in SCC from 800 to 350. How did that go? What were the problems you noticed before that you managed to solve here? Well, we have quite a few training sequences. Why? When you work with the same thing every day, sometimes the routine ends up masking some processes, some steps. So... Every month we have training sessions to prevent people from getting used to making mistakes. For example, the simple act of drying a teat in a certain way has an impact on the CBT. Understand? So here we have a routine of double pre-dipping the cows and we do the three jet strip cup test. We have to respect the cow's stimulation time. When you start handling the animal's teats, there's a time required for oxytocin release, which triggers milk letdown. So we must respect this stimulation time. All of this is achieved through training. And this labor is at a crucial moment. This is a moment of high tension. People can't be on their cell phones. Just like in Sao Paulo, where they were on their phones while working, it's not possible here. 
not at all. They must be focused. That's right. And then the cows start to come in. How many people work in the milking process? Today we have three people at the start of the carousel. One is responsible for the double pre-dipping and the three jet strip cup test. Then there's another person who only dries the cow's teats and another person who only attaches the milking machines. At the end of the carousel cycle, there's a person who performs the post-dipping. Then this cow is released by lot. I see. So how many people are here? Here, there are four. Four people working directly on the carousel during milking and another person fetching the lots and bringing the animals to the waiting room. Nice. How many were there before? Before, we worked with three people. So you ended up with one more person, but you went from 14 to 48 cows. So the system is technology. There's no doubt about that. You're increasingly professionalizing your activity by implementing a high-tech system. But as you mentioned, if the person there doesn't know exactly what they need to do at that moment, what if the first one makes a mistake? Then it's a cascading effect. If they don't do a good pre-dipping, a proper stimulation of the cow, the cow won't release the milk. And if we don't respect the stimulation time, the cow won't release the milk. So what happens? She finishes the cycle, completes the turn on the carousel, and the milking isn't complete. Then this animal has to return for milking, or worse, if a cow leaves with milk still in the mammary gland, she risks developing an inflammatory process, mastitis, because the milk hasn't been expelled. You mentioned something interesting, again, mastitis. Before it was about wet bedding. Here, it's about how the milking is done. What else could be impacting, for example, mastitis in the animals? Mastitis is also related to the cleanliness of these animals. If the bedding is wet, the animals will be dirtier. What does this affect? The person doing the pre-dipping. Is it the person here? Exactly. Because if the cow comes in dirty, we can't wash the udder. We perform a pre-dipping, and we need to remove all that dirt to prevent contamination during milking. Why? Milking involves a process that has moisture and the cow's warmth. What do bacteria need? Heat and moisture. So if the person responsible for pre-dipping doesn't clean the cow well, and the milking cluster is applied to a dirty teat, this also predisposes the entry of bacteria into the mammary gland. If a cow with mastitis enters here, does she pass it on to the others? No. Yes, she does. Milking also serves as a vehicle for bacteria. That's why the farm has mastitis lots today. This mastitis lot is milked last to avoid cross-contamination during milking. I understand. So there's a lot for those that produce more, a high production lot, those that produce less, and those with mammary gland inflammation. Yes, those with mastitis. And there's a sequence. It's not all at once. No, no. Which group do you start with? We start with the high production cows, then the medium production cows, then the low production cows, followed by cows that have recovered from mastitis. And finally, those currently with an inflammatory process, those with mastitis. Now, for those on the other side, folks, it's a careful process. If you want to destroy a herd, start with the mastitis cows first. Exactly because you'll be spreading it to all the other cows. When is the sphincter open? During milking. So at that moment, you're exposing the animal to the risk of bacteria entering the mammary gland. That's interesting. If the person handling the cows touches the wrong cow, the wrong lot, they can ruin everything. What happens to a high production cow that's milked after a mastitis cow? What happens to that area, to that lot? The cow comes into contact with the bacteria and if her immune system is lower, that will be a problem for her, and the bacteria will thrive, leading to an inflammatory process. If she lies down afterward, she might leave contaminated milk residue there, potentially spreading it to more animals in the bedding. Mastitis is something those who work with dairy are familiar with, as it's part of the daily uh, routine for those in the industry. But we implement all these processes 
separating by lot, proper milking, well-prepared bedding, to what end? To reduce the incidence of new cases. Some animals are chronic. These animals are either cold or their teat is dried, something along those lines. But our role as farm veterinarians is to minimize, to reduce the incidence of new cases. I see. So regarding the milking process, I think we've managed to convey to everyone what really matters, which is getting the basics right. Separating the lots, the high production lot, the medium production lot, the low production lot, those that have already recovered, and finally, those with mastitis. That's the basics. The second point is training the people who are doing the milking. If the people don't know what they're doing and what they need to do, it could lead to problems. Exactly. And knowing which bacteria are present on the farm, we have bacterial profiles, contagious and environmental. So you need to know what you're dealing with. That's why we have culture tools and antibiograms today, so we can develop strategies to minimize the damage from infections. Which ones do you use here? How do you identify them today? So, for example, when a cow is identified with mastitis, clinical mastitis, clots, we collect a sample of her milk and send it to the lab. At the lab, we do a test called culture, which is where bacterial growth occurs. We then identify uh, which bacteria are involved in that inflammatory process. From there, we can direct a treatment for that animal. And you can identify this with the data you're collecting from them. Exactly. So you know exactly which animal and which bacteria that animal has. That's right. Besides the individual SCC, we do monthly monitoring where we collect a sample from each animal during milking and send it to the lab. There we perform a somatic cell count. It will tell us how many thousands of cells are present. A healthy cow has fewer than 200,000 cells. Below that, she's healthy. Above that, she has some degree of infection. Clinical cows that show clots usually have over a million somatic cells. What is this exfoliation? When bacteria enter the mammary gland, the defense cells act on that foreign organism, increasing the somatic cell count. That's why we do this individual SCC. Those cows with a higher count are the ones with what we call subclinical mastitis. They don't show clinical signs like clots, but there is an alteration in somatic cell count. And you can only know this by following the correct procedure. Exactly. So folks, we're going to wrap up this video with this lesson on milk quality management. It starts with the person bringing in the animals, then the animal enters. The people taking care of the milking need to be trained. You have to collect milk from these animals to know the SCC count for each one. Collecting this data will have to become basic for future generations. A farm can't sustain itself without identifying these details. And the system is very important. 1,800,000. But the workforce is also crucial. Without qualified labor, unfortunately, it's not possible to operate. So that's an important message for everyone. I think a challenge we can pose to those watching is to send something to us. I think that's interesting. It could also help someone who's just starting out or has some doubts. It could be showing a bit of their milking routine. Yes, absolutely. I think the milking routine is very important. Very important. So if someone could record their milking routine, showing what they've managed to get right or what they did, how they instructed the person doing the milking to do it this way. And if it worked, film it, record it, take photos and show it. If you have something visual on your farm, for example, if you have things described as they should be done, uh, take a photo, tag Santa Fe. It will be a pleasure to repost and show as many people as possible what's been working. That's what will help other producers sustain themselves, continue in the activity, and succeed in it. Agreed? A hug and see you in the next video.